Obaye. In Christianity, God is a preserver. In Christianity, God is a deliverer. In Christianity, God is one who prospers. He's a prosperer. He's one who prospers. So in Christianity, God is our suitor. Welcome, precious people. This is the Dasco Moment with Minister Higher Life, a moment of truth and learning our foundational matters in the faith. Now, today we want to start a new series, and the series is titled The Ministry of the Christian. We want to take a time and go through the Word of God and look through and see our eternal assignment or our eternal purpose given to us by God. What is the essence of being born again? After being born again, having the truth, knowing who you are in Christ. What is next? Do you just get to know your righteous? Do you just get to know your holy? Do you just get to know you are born again? What is next, all right? So without wasting much time, I want us to go into the word of God. Second Corinthians chapter number five. Second Corinthians five seventeen. Now, let me begin from 14. The Bible says, For the love of Christ constraineth us. I'm reading from the King James. Because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Wherefore henceforth know we no man after the flesh. Yeah, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. For if, therefore, if any man be in Christ, now I want you to take critical notice of that. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. And hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit, verse 19, to wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Praise the name of the Lord. After being born again, there is, an, there is a ministry that God gives you. And the Bible sums the whole ministry as the ministry of reconciliation. Now, when you get born again, the Bible is very emphatic. You become a new creation. Now, who is a new creation? A new creation is one whose past has no legal claim over his life. The sins you committed, the, the place you were born, the whatever that surrounds your life. Now, when you get born again, the Bible says all things have become new. Your faith in Christ Jesus brings you to a point of absolute newness. All right, so when you get born again, you are not the old person again. When you get born again, you are a new creation. Now, the word new from the Greek is kainos. Now, kainos is, um, it means unused, something that has never been used before. It's the emergence of a new species. That's the word kainos. So if anyone gets born again, that person becomes a new person a kind of creature that has never existed before. The, the, the life, the nature of God comes to live in that person. But you see, all these things are, uh, all these things that happen to us are for a purpose. We don't just get born again, become a new creation and just shout about it. We become new creations with a mandate. So the Bible says, having become new creations, the verse 18 says that, and all things are of God. The all things here refer to the new nature. Everything that is involved in the new creation are of God. So when you get born again, everything about you emanates from God. It comes from God. It is from, it is from the God realm. When you read James chapter 1, James 1, quickly let's run. Then we'll come back here. But let me just take um, some few moments to let you understand something. Now let's go to James chapter 1. From the verse 17. Now let me begin from 16. The Bible says, Do not err, 
my beloved brethren, because every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and coming down from the Father of light, with whom is no variableness, praise the name of the Lord, neither shadow of turning. Of his own will begat he us, glory to God. Of his own will begat he us, hallelujah, with the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruit among his creatures. So when you get born again, all things are of God. Every good gift, every perfect gift comes from God. It comes from the father of light. So when what we read in um, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse, verse 18, the Bible says, and all things are of God. We can say, and all things come from God. All right, uh, through, through our didasco teachings, I have, I have brought you to a place of understanding, letting you know some of the things that you received when you got born again. We spoke about the, the Holy Ghost receiving the Spirit of God. We're going we to have a recap into that in this particular um, series. You, you, you got born again. You were delivered from the power of darkness. You received um, forgiveness and all of that. All these things are of God. There's nothing that comes from you. All these things are of God. Your total uh, nature, the totality of your nature, the totality of your newness, all the components of your newness emanates from God. Now, that is something that you must understand. You see, there are a lot of people who get to think that, oh, being born again, there are things I have to add to my life before I can move with God. But when you get born again, the Bible says all things are of God. All that we do here, all that we do as Christians is simply to realize the things that emanate, the things that come from God. All right? So he says, all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself. This is very important. That when you get born again, you are reconciled to God. Now, the, to reconcile means to, to bring back again. It actually means to exchange. In the Greek, it means to exchange. All right? So it is where there is enmity, there is anger between two parties, and then it is exchanged for peace. So to, to, to reconcile means to bring a, um, two parties together, two parties who couldn't see eye to eye, to bring them together. Now, the Bible says that um, all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself. The Lord took, our Father took the initiative in bringing us to himself. All right, when you read 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18, let, let's go there. Let's go to 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. We are going to have an amazing time. All right, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. The Bible says, For Christ also hath once suffered for sins. Amazing. The just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. All right, so Christ went through all the things he went through that he might bring us to God. This is very important. There are a lot of Christians who have believed in Jesus, yet they see God afar. They see that God is very far away from them. This is a truth that we cannot joke with. The Bible says Christ died, the just for the unjust. He died once for our sins. Now the word once there means once for all times. He's not going to die again. And he died for our sins so that he will bring us, he will lead us to God. He will bring us home. All right. So when you believe in Jesus Christ, you simply activate the purpose to which he died, to which he died. And what is that? You come home with God. Now, coming home with God is what 2 Corinthians says, we are reconciled back to God. So God takes the initiative through Christ to reconcile us to God. We come, we come to have a communion with God. You know, when you read 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 9, the Bible says, God is faithful by whom you were called unto the fellowship of his son onto the communion of his son, onto the friendship of his son. So when you get born again, it is a coming, it's a, it's a coming back to divinity. It's a coming back to God. When you get born again, it's a coming back to God. You see, the whole idea, I was telling some people the other day, that you don't get born again to march to Zion. You know, there, there's a song, we are marching to Zion. Beautiful, beautiful Zion. That's wrong. We don't, you don't get born again to march 
into Zion. All right, just for the record, let's get into the word. Let me show you something. This is not part of it. I just want to chip this in so that you understand something. All right. Hebrews chapter number 12. Let's get there. Hebrews chapter 12. The Bible says in verse 22, he says, but ye, but you are come unto Mount Zion. You have come unto Mount Zion. Uh, come on, say, I have come unto Mount Zion. He says, you have come unto Mount Zion and unto the city of the living God. He didn't say you are marching. He didn't say you are about to come there. He didn't say he's going to bring you there. He says, being born again, you have come. All right, the word come there means you have appeared. We were born Zionite. We were born in Zion. So he says, you have come unto Zion, the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels. You've come to the place where the angels cannot be counted. So being born again, you live in, you, you, you live, you live in a company of innumerable angels, angels that cannot be counted. All right? That's what it means. So you are not marching to Zion. You are not preparing to get to Zion. That is wrong, you know. And mostly they sing that song when somebody is dead. So we say, oh, we're all marching to Zion. So when you die, you go to Zion. You go to Zion. No. When you die, you don't go to Zion. When you get born again, you are born in Zion. The Christian does not march to Zion. The Christian is born in Zion. The Christian comes in Zion. He appears in Zion. All right? So that is wrong. So let's continue. Then he says, and to, um, so to the general assembly and church of the firstborn. So what is Zion? Zion simply means the church of Christ. All right? So to the church of the firstborn. And who is the firstborn? Jesus Christ. So Zion is Christ and his church. So when you get born again, in order to say, or the, uh, we can say, you, for us to say you are born again, we can say it in a different way by saying you have come to Zion. So you have come to Zion means that you are born again. Now, if you say you are marching to Zion, you are simply saying, I'm preparing to be born again. And that's absurd. All right? That's absurd. So that is that. Let's get back to what I was sharing with you. All right? 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter number 5, verse um, 18. So all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself. All right? So when you get born again, you are reconciled to God. This is very important. It means that, let me, let me show you something. The Bible says that there is one mediator between God and men. Not God and Christians. Christ is not a mediator between us and God. Jesus died to bring us to God. Hallelujah. And that's why the Bible does not tell us to pray through Jesus. The Bible says we should pray in the name of Jesus. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. When you get born again, you have passed on the way to the Father. So even Jesus is not a mediator between you and God, all right? Now I'm going to, in this series, I'm going to kind of say some hard things, all right? So Jesus is not a mediator between you and God. Uh -uh. Jesus brings you to God. So the Bible says that he died so that he will bring us to God. He will bring us back to God. See, when man sinned in the garden, man was separated from God. All right, when you read Ephesians 2, you can read the whole of Ephesians 2 and, and you can get the story there, all right? For the sake of time, we're not going to read it. But man was separated from God. The whole issue of being born again, all right, is not just going to church. It's not finding friends who go to church. It's not going to register your name in a church. Being born again simply means you are coming back to God, all right? So what, what, what man lost in the garden has been restored, Man was with God and man sinned and man got separated from God. Now, when you get born again, you are brought back to God. So Jesus died to bring us back to God. This is a big truth. All right. He died to bring us to God. I'm not a stranger being born again. I am in the household of God. I'm a member of God's family. Oh, hallelujah. I'm a member of God's family. So you're brought to God. All right? So now listen. He says that having been brought to God, he says who has reconciled. So God, all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. Our, our reconciliation came about by Jesus Christ. Now by Jesus Christ means by the sacrifice of Jesus, by the death of Jesus, by the burial of Jesus, by the resurrection of Jesus. So by the things that Jesus did, i.e. his burial, 
his, I'm sorry, his death, his burial, his resurrection, and his ascension into glory, we are brought, see, we are brought to God. So by that. So God used what Jesus did as a platform to be able to mingle with us. All right? So he did that by Jesus Christ. Then he says, and has given to us the ministry of reconciliation. Now, this is what I want to talk about today. All right? Jesus Christ died to bring us to God so that we will also receive the ministry of reconciliation. So every Christian has a ministry. Now, I've heard a lot of people say, oh, I'm not called. Uh, there are some special people who are called to do the work of God, all right? So it's, oh, I'm just a backbencher. Uh-uh. If God wants you to be, if God wanted you to be a backbencher when you got born again, the best way to be a backbencher is to die. Because the Bible says in Hebrews that there is a great cloud of witness. You know what they are doing? They are sitting at the sides of, of the stadia or the stadium and they are watching us play. You understand? So if you're born again and you are alive, you are not a backbencher. All right? You are not a spectator. The spectators are those who have gone to be with the Lord. So when, when I hear a Christian says, I'm not called. Uh, um, God has called some people to do the work of God. You know, oh, let's go for evangelism. He says, I'm not called. Let's go and say, I'm not called. It's for some people. No. No. All right? It's for every single person. In fact, the Bible makes a very emphatic statement. Maybe we are going to take a critical look at it, not today. But the Bible says that he gave gifts to men. He gave some apostles, prophets, teachers, evangelists, pastors. All right? And the Bible says he did that, the fivefold ministries, for the perfecting of the saint for the work of the ministry. So the reason why your pastor is there is to make you to work for God. All right? The whole idea of becoming a Christian or in fact, the, you start to live your Christian life when you get actively involved in the ministry of reconciliation. You get, you, you, you get to live your Christian life. The start of your Christian life or bearing fruit as a Christian or growing as a Christian is simply being active in the ministry of reconciliation. Now, what is the ministry of reconciliation? I told you reconciliation is putting parties together putting two sides that didn't want to see eye to eye, bringing them together. Now, if we have received the ministry of reconciliation, it means that we have the ministry of bringing people back to God. All right, so every Christian has the ministry of bringing people back to God. It is our ministry. It is the heartbeat of God. It is the dream of God. You see, in one of the, in one of the episodes, I told you, that I read from the word that the Bible says God wants all men saved. And that is the ministry of reconciliation. God wants all men saved. God wants all men to come to him. So the moment you get born again, you are implanted, you are brought into that very agenda of God. And what is that agenda? To bring men, to make men friends of God. So that cocaine dealer, that drug addict, that homosexual, that whoever, that armed robber, there is, there, there is a ministry that we carry and the ministry is to bring these people, make them friends of God. It's amazing. A lot of Christians have rather made people feel that they are enemies of God or God is against them. God, is, God will kill you. God is about to. I remember when COVID came, now everybody said that is God's judgment to the world because um, the world has become sinful. So God is cleaning the land. I mean, when did COVID become blood? There is no spiritual detergent as powerful as the blood of Jesus Christ. It is the blood of Jesus that has the power to... This morning I was singing a song, all right? The Bible says that, um, praise the Lord, all right? The one that has believed in Jesus, he says, the vilest offender who truly believes, that moment from Jesus, he receives a pardon. The blood of Jesus is able to wash that person so clean, regardless of his sins. And this is what the Lord wants us to do. Bringing men to himself. Making men friends of God. When you look at a prostitute, can that prostitute be a friend of God? You see, and the Bible says that ministry, God has given us that ministry. You have that ministry to make, to make 
peace between God and men. Now, Jesus died, and that is the first thing. Now, you now stand on what Christ has done to, to bring men to God. Are we together? To bring men to God. And this is a serious ministry that we have. Any Christian that is not actively involved in bringing men to God, that Christian is becoming problem or problematic in the body of Christ. Why? Because, see, if every one of you listening to me will actively involve him or herself in the work of God, I'm telling you, we would win more souls than we have won, all right? If everybody gets involved, most often than not, a lot of people think, oh, I'm, I'm not called. One day, we're praying for somebody, and then a pastor came, and the pastor said, you, you are too young to pray. You are too young to pray for the person, because when you pray and the demon leaves the person, the, the, the demon will come and enter you, because you are not spiritually strong. And that was stupid, all right? Listen. Every single person, the moment you get born again, now I'll talk to you about the spirit in a moment, all right? The moment you get born again, there is a ministry on your head. There is a ministry you are brought into. See, there is no such thing as irrelevant Christian. Every Christian is relevant to the things of God. Every Christian is relevant to the ministry that God has given. Every Christian. In fact, let me shock you. To the Christian that is even sinning, that Christian is relevant to God. So if that Christian will wake up and realize that there's no time and realize that we were born onto an agenda, I always say something, that bringing people to God, reconciliation, reconciling people to God, winning souls and telling people about the gospel, preaching the gospel is the father's business. And we were born onto the family business. The family business of God is bringing men to God. Is bringing people who are vile, who are vile offenders, people who don't even want to see God, who don't want to hear God, bringing them to God. The Christian has a ministry. Every Christian has a ministry. Every child of God has a ministry. Every Christian. Someone say, um, I don't even know my ministry yet. Aha. Uh -huh. So there is that which is called the foundational ministry, the ministry for every Christian. I want you to. I want you to close your eye at this moment and shout it, I have a ministry. There is a ministry that is committed to me. And you see, this ministry is bringing people to God. It's, it's bringing people to God. And amazingly, when you bring people to God, then they also bring people to God. Because somebody brought me to God. Somebody taught me the word of God. Somebody preached to me. Somebody got me born again. And I also have gotten people born again. Now, it is your turn to also get people born again, to matter in the agenda of God. You see, we live in days and time that you cannot, I want to repeat that again, you cannot give yourself to excuses. You cannot give your mind to frivolities. You can't give your attention to things that have no eternal value. All right? You can't, you can't afford to do that because, listen, every minute counts. Every second counts. Some of you, you are in various campuses. Some of you, you are in, in various professions. And yet, people cannot even see that you are a Christian. There, there is no Christian heat. You don't, you don't carry the fire. All right? In the early days, when a Christian appears, you will know that a Christian... Let me, let me show you something. Jesus' dream of what Christians were to be. He wrote it down. He wrote it down in Mark. We'll, we'll look at it extensively. He wrote it down in Mark chapter 16. 16 verse 17. Let, let me show you quickly. Let me show you. This, you will like it. Let me show you. Mark 16 verse 17. Listen to what Jesus said. Let me begin from 16. He says that, um, no, let me, let me begin from, um, I think 15 will be fine, all right? And he said unto them, talking about the disciples, he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. This is what Jesus told the disciples. He says, Go ye into all the world. Go into every atmosphere. Go into every system and preach the word. Preach the gospel to every creature. Now listen. Then he says, He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. And he that believeth not shall be condemned. Now look at what Jesus, Jesus said. Then Jesus says, And these signs shall follow them that believe. 
So Jesus says, this is the dream. This is what I have prepared. This is my mind for all those who are going to believe. All right? All those who are going to believe your message, all those who are going to believe the gospel, he says, these signs shall follow them that believe. Now, are you a believer? Then Jesus has a destined, has some destined signs that must follow you. This is to every Christian. He did not say these signs shall follow pastors. He did not say these signs shall follow prophets. He didn't say these signs shall follow the apostles. He didn't say these signs shall follow them that, that are born again um, 50 years um, 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 on, and all of that. He said these signs shall follow them that believe. The moment a man put his heart into the gospel of Christ, believing the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ, these signs are mandated to follow you. Number one, he says, these are the signs in my name. Number one, they will cast out devils. My goodness, hallelujah. So if you want to know a Christian, one day I was talking to somebody and the person was preparing to go, um, to go and get baptized, to go and get baptized in water. Then I asked the person, why are you going to be baptized? I just wanted to ask. I just wanted to prick his heart. Then say, oh, um, I'm going to be baptized because I'm born again. I've been born again for many years and I've not been baptized. And I said, so why now? Why are you going to be baptized now? He said, oh, you know, baptism is an outward show that a man has given his life to Christ. The Bible never said so. The outward show that a man has believed or has given his life to Christ, number one, in the name of Jesus, that man will cast out devils. This is how we know a Christian. How do we know a Christian? We know a Christian. Who is a Christian? The one that has believed in the message of the apostles. I don't have time to expand to you what the message of the apostles are. Jesus says, you shall be my witnesses. You shall be witnesses of me. All right? So he spoke about the apostles. He said the apostles are going to be witnesses of him. That witnessing, they've witnessed, they've witnessed to us. We have believed their message. And Jesus says, when you believe in the message, you become a Christian, right? And the first thing that must follow every Christian, Kobaya, every Christian, every child of God, the first thing that must follow that Christian, number one, in the name of Jesus, that Christian has what it takes to cast out devils. Jesus didn't say through my name. Jesus did not even say by my name. Jesus did not say at the mention of my name. Jesus is in my name. In my name is a legal, it carries a legal ideal. And what is that? It is a delegated authority. So it means that we will act in his name like, like a president sending somebody. The person is treated as the president. So Jesus says, in my name. It means they will act and when they act, it will be like I am acting. Every authority, every power that backs my casting out of demon, you know what? They have it. So every Christian, the moment you get born again, it's, you see, it's not when you get born again and you get trained. It's not even when you get born again and 10 years time. Uh -uh. The moment you say, dear Lord Jesus, you know, Romans chapter 8, verse, uh, Romans chapter 10, verse, verse 9 and 10. The Bible says, um, and if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus uh, and shall believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, Thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth uh, confession is made unto salvation. So the moment you believe in Christ, the moment you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and your personal Savior, the Bible says these signs shall follow you. First sign, in my name, they will cast out devils. Every Christian is a devil chaser. Every Christian is a demon caster. Every Christian is a terror to the kingdom of hell. Hallelujah. And this is what a lot of Christians are not told today. Today, in the house of God, in the body of Christ, in the church of Christ, we tell people that generational curses are following them. We tell them that there's an ancestral curse that is following them. Where did we get it wrong? Jesus says, when somebody gets born again, these are signs that will follow the person. See, there are signs that, that are following me everywhere I go. I know that, you see, and I don't cast out demons because I'm a pastor. Uh -uh. I cast out demons because I'm born again. I cast out demons because I have believed in Christ Jesus. I have believed in the message of Christ. Jesus brought a message. And the message is that man can come back to God. Man can come back to their father. Are you understanding that? And these signs shall follow them that believe in the message of Christ. He says that, number one, they shall cast out devils. They will, they will, they will cast out devils in his name. Not in your name. Now, let me give you a typical example of what it means in my name. 
Let's say that you are driving. You are driving one hot afternoon, and then you see a policeman. This guy is drunk, but the person is in uniform. This guy looks very, he doesn't even look handsome. He looks smallish, and he's, he's, yet he's in uniform. Then you're coming, and the person stands in the middle of the road, and he does this. Now, what does that mean? It means stop. Whether you believe him or you don't believe him, whether he's drunk or he's not drunk, or he's stopping you in the name of the government of Ghana. So you don't, you don't pack the car and go and ask him, um, uh, uh, why are you drunk? Uh-uh. You see, that is authority. Sometimes um, some people are like, I was talking to somebody, and then the person says, I have not prayed enough. Now, prayer is good, but Jesus did not say that they will cast out devils after they have prayed. It is when you believe. So when you believe, you are like that policeman. This is not about your character. It's not about your attitude. It's about your position. It's about your belief. All right? So you, you believing in Jesus, you have received the authority to cast out devils. Look at yourself. Put your hands on your chest and shout it, I cast out devils. Now, I did not say say it. I say shout it, you know. So shout it. If there's anybody around you, let them hear. This is it. You can't be a Christian and accept that there is a generational case that is following you. That is, that is, you know, a lot of people, a lot of Africans are Africanizing Christianity. You get it? We are used to demonic things. We are used to, you know, in my village, there's a fetish priest who, who can be dancing and he will stand on a rooftop or on a ceiling and then he will be bringing money and will be walking on a thin thread and stuff like that. We'll be walking in the sky and all of that. So, so we've seen all these kind of things that we think that all Christianity is about. It's about what somebody is doing against you, uh, what your family spirit is doing against you, what um, one auntie is doing against you, and what, what is doing against your stuff. That is not Christianity. See, Christians are not people who are on the defensive side. Uh -uh. We are at the offensive side. We don't defend. Uh -uh. We offend. So say, ah, oh, there's somebody that's a witch in your family. Then, you know, you go and see one, one, one on serious man of God. The person now gives you sand. Then he gives you um, sand. Then he tell you, mix the sand with palm oil and then put seven salt inside. When you finish, then you add three leaves to it. Then you put 50 pesos coin inside. Then when you're done, you put ginger inside. Then you blend. After you put the ginger, you, you blend some garlic and then you put it inside. When you are done, then you put pepper inside inside, then you put the picture of those who are doing you inside. That is madness. When you get born again, curses don't follow you. Jesus says one of the signs that follow you is that in his name you cast out devils. This is the, these are the signs, these are the things that, that identify a Christian. These are the outward signs of a Christian. That Christian does not tolerate the activities of demons. Uh -uh. That Christian is, is not a sweet place for demonic activities. One day we were, we were in a car. I was in a car with one of the pastors called Pastor Kelvin. And we we're coming from Accra. And I think we, we had gone for a program with Pastor Chris. And then we're in the car. We're coming. Then we got to a place like, um, I'd say like 300 meters to where we had to alight. Then a lady started convulsing in the car seriously. Now, we were at the back seat. It, it was as if we were wired together. I just jumped on the lady. The lady was right at the back of the driver. I jumped on the lady. I blasted in tongues and I casted out demon, the demon and the lady manifested in the car. And, and we had to pass where we were going. And then she was okay. We left the lady okay. So a Christian is not a nice place for demonic activities. Jesus says, this sign shall follow them that believe. I want you to arise in your consciousness. I want you to arise in your mind. I want you to arise in your spirit. That See, listen, there is a move. There is a shift. There is a stirring. And God expects you to rise up to this call. The ministry of reconciliation. We have a ministry. Are we together? Then Jesus said, number two, they will speak with new tongues. They will kabareko brakata lego shabragade. They will speak with new tongues. They will speak in tongues. Now, so if you see somebody pray in tongues, it is the outward sign that this is a Christian. All right. So he says, in my name they will cast out devils. They will speak with new tongues. Now let's continue. Then he says that 
um, they shall take up serpent. Now, serpent in the word of God is symbolic of demonic powers. You know, Jesus said that in Luke, he, say, he, he says that in Luke, he says, I give you power to tread over serpents and scorpions. That word serpents and scorpions, right from the word of God, is a description of the power of the enemy, the, venom, the, the, the venomous power of the enemy. So when the Bible uses serpent and scorpions, it talks about the poisonous power of the enemy. And the Bible says when you get born again, you will lift it up. Do you know what it means to lift it up? To lift it up means to, to remove it from where it is and place it to where place it at where it ought to be. Are we together? That is why, as a Christian, you must not be scared about the power of the enemy. One day, we 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 woke up to go and open our shop. I, I was done with senior high school, junior high school. I don't know which one, but I was done with, with one of them. And then when we went to open the shop. I saw three three eggs and some red cloths, you know, those kind of things, and feathers and some 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 crazy stuff. I didn't say, ah, I was not a pastor, I was a Christian. I didn't say, oh my God, where is my pastor? Uh uh-uh, uh 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 uh. Now, the the unfortunate thing was that the eggs were broken. That that was it. You know what I would have done? I would have taken the eggs because I had a stove in the shop. I would have fried them, and I had an oil, and I had I had onions there. I would have fried them. See, we take the power of God, we, we, we take the power of the enemy, and we put it where it belongs. Are you understanding that? So I say, ah, I had a dream, and in the dream I was eating. So they say, you are going to get witchcraft, you are going to get sickness and stuff like that. I had a dream. You think the devil is so kind to serve you food in your dream? No. Even if it is the food of the devil, what do you do to it? You eat it. Jesus says, you, Jesus, you know what Jesus says? He says, they will take up serpent. Now, let's continue. Then he says that, and this is an interesting passage. And if they drink any deadly thing, kabasuta kabaya, it shall not hurt them. That's what Jesus said. He says, if they drink any deadly thing, it means that if they are poisoned, it can't work on them. Now, this, this, this is what this is Jesus' definition of a Christian. All right. This, if you if you went to Jesus and you asked Jesus, who is a Christian? Jesus will say, number one, they cast out devils. Number two, they speak with tongues. Number two, they take up serpent. Number three, they drink deadly things and it does not hurt them. They get poison, it doesn't hurt them. Hallelujah. Then the last one says, they shall lay their hands on the sick and they will recover. Now, I will take my time and expand all these things in the subsequent videos. He says, they will lay their hands on the sick. And they will recover. So every Christian has what it takes to put his hand on the sick and get that person healed. Are we together? So this is, this is the ministry of reconciliation that we have. Bringing people to God. Bringing people to God. And every Christian is involved or every Christian must be involved. This is Jesus' dream of who a Christian is. This is Jesus' dream of what, um, what we are supposed to be. So what we read in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18 and 19, it says we have received the ministry of reconciliation. We have received the ministry of bringing people back to God. And you see, you cannot receive a ministry without being empowered. In our next video, I'll take time to explain to you the empowerment that we have in carrying out that ministry. Every Christian must be involved. Listen, let, let, me, let, me, let me show you something quickly. All right, so Luke chapter 24. So Luke 4, 46, the Bible says, And he said unto them, Thus it is written. All right, thus it is written. And thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. So Jesus told his disciples, this is what you are supposed to do, all right? You are supposed to tell the world. You are supposed to tell them their sins are forgiven. You are supposed to carry out the ministry of reconciliation, and every Christian must be involved. Don't say you're a weak Christian. Don't say, I have a lot of problems I'm dealing with. Uh-uh. There is that which is called the ministry of the Christian. 
the ministry of the Christian. I have a ministry as a Christian. I have a ministry as a believer. I have a ministry. And you see, that ministry is very simple. Bringing people to God. It can be your mother. It can be your friend. It can be that, that, that friend at work, your colleague. You see, wherever you are, the Bible made a very powerful statement. In Matthew, 4, in Matthew 5, 14, let's read that. Very important. And then I'm, I'll wrap it up and then bring it to a close. Matthew chapter number 5, verse 14. The Bible says, Ye are the light of the world. All right, he's talking to us who believe in him. He says, ye are the light of the world. All right, then he says, you are a city that is set on a hill that cannot be hid. So this is who we are. We are the light of the world. You see, the world is hopeless without Christ. And Christ is in us here in this world. The world is hopeless without Christians. The world is hopeless. Don't mind all those people who say, uh, we don't need Christianity. The problem of the world is because of religion and stuff like that. They don't know what they're talking about. We are the light of the world. We are a city that is set up on a hill that cannot be hid. He says that you are the salt of the earth. What is salt used for? Salt is used for preservation. We are those that preserve the earth. We are those that preserve the world from corruption. We are the light of the world. We are those that have the light of God to permeate through every darkness. I want to encourage you. Don't belittle yourself. We have come to a point in our faith that this is so much needed that you will not be a backbencher. All right, you will not be a back, back, backbencher. In the next, in the next video, I will tell you something. He says that I will open a pool of waters in the desert land. You see, the spirit of God in us calls us today into the ministry of the Christian. He calls us today that we will become fruitful in the field. Jesus says something. He said that the harvest is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Would you be a laborer today? Would you make up your mind today to, to say that I, I don't know how I'm even going to start, but I am going to, I am going to be effective in the things of God. I don't, I don't, maybe you were effective, you used to be effective, but now it looks like your fire is down. You feel like giving up. I want you to look at God's heart. I want you to look at God's mind. There's nothing in this world that is worth living for. There's nothing in this world that is worth dying for. There's nothing in this world that is worth giving your life to except Christ and his mandate, except Christ and his agenda, except Christ and his purpose. Paul made a very amazing statement in Galatians chapter number two. Look at what Paul said. Paul said in Galatians chapter, chapter number two, amazing, amazing. Galatians chapter two, verse 20. Paul says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I. He says, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. He says that I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I. But the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I am crucified with Christ. To be crucified with Christ, it means to, to, to be intertwined with Christ in what he's doing. To be intertwined with Christ, with what he's doing. What is Christ doing? Paul says, I'm crucified with Christ. I am crucified with Christ. I pray in the name of Jesus. You see, our generation is becoming so soft on these things. You know, we think church and, and Christianity is all about pictures, social media, um, showing this, showing that, showing this, showing that. No. There is a crucifixion with Christ. Christianity is crucifixion with Christ. It's where you are blended, oh boy, shut up. You are blended with Christ in his vision. You are blended with Christ in his mandate. It is where your whole life is all about Christ. It's, it's, a, it's called living. He says, the life which I now live in the flesh. I live, I live, I live, I live. Listen, he says, I live by the faith. I live by the faith. 
of the Son of God. Paul says, I live by the faith. Now, the Greek word for faith is pistis. I live by the convictions. I live by the convictions of the Son of God. It, it can also be said, I live by the dream of Jesus. What do you live by? What are we living by these days? All right? We're living by our ambitions. We are living by what is trending. We are living by the opinions of people. We are living by our last. We are living by the things we crave for. This is a generation we are craving for money. We are craving for fame. We are craving for power. We are craving everybody wants to better himself. Everybody thinks more about what they can, the value they can add to themselves. But listen, we are going to be here for just a few years. We're going to be here for, we are not going to be here for 200 years. No, 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 It's a, either you're going to die or you, uh, you will vanish. However, the truth is this. We will not spend 200 years. Can you think about the fact that 200 years from now, even if Jesus had not come, if Jesus, if Jesus has not come, it's going to be new people. There will be no me. There will be no you. But you see, in eternity, we are going to live in eternity for eternity. We will live in eternity. So you see, we need, to, we need to have eternity in view. We need to have eternity in focus. We are distracted with so much things. We are distracted with a lot of things. But you see, there's one thing that matters. At the end of the day, at the end of it all, did you live a life for Jesus? Were you bold about your faith? Did you tell that colleague at the office about Jesus? Did you tell that sister or that brother about Jesus? How well did you work in the ministry of reconciliation? I pray for you today that in the name of Jesus Christ, you would drop, you would drop the pride. You would drop the cares of this world. You would drop your personal ambitions. Yes, you are going to work. Yes, you are going to go to school. Yet you are going to go into that profession. But listen, your heart will be founded upon Christ. Your heart will be founded upon Christ. You will talk to that person at your office about Jesus. You will talk to that mate who sit next to you about Jesus. You will not live your life in conformity to the world. You will not become so uh, indifferent. No, 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 no. Because there are people, when you look at them, they are not different from their friends. They are not different from their worldly friends. They go to the same places they go to. They also go to the nightclub. They also play the same songs. They also dance to the same songs. They, they do the same thing. They, they say the same vulgar things. You understand? They do the same thing. There's no difference. You see, there is that spirit of fire that comes into the Christian. All right? I'll tell you in the next video. The, the, the Bible says something. He says that, and I'll pour out my spirit. I come to pass after in those days that I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh. I will pour. I will release my spirit. That's what God is saying. He says, I'm going to build an army. But this army, I will pour my spirit upon them. I'll pour out. God says, I'll pour out. You see, the word pour out, it, it, it means to immensely supply. To give without measure. He says, I will cobra esto, Adavi. I, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. He says, everyone, every, he says, your sons and daughters, they will prophesy. It is going to be a holy commotion in all the earth. It's going to be a holy commotion in all the earth. You can catch that spirit wherever you are. You can catch that spirit wherever you are. Listen, I know that there is the fire of God in you. You can't deny it. There is that knock of Jesus on your heart daily, having known Jesus, that this is not your life. Even if you have been caught in sin and you feel like you can't come out, even if you have been caught in lukewarmness and you feel like you cannot come out, even if you are caught in offense, you think somebody has offended you, a brother has offended you to the point that you don't want to go to church again. I know that deep within your heart, Jesus constantly talks to you. Deep within your heart, the Spirit of God is knocking on your heart that come for this thing. Do this thing. This is your life's mandate. And I pray in the name of Jesus. I pray for you. I pray for you that you never be comfortable. I pray for you. You never be comfortable in lukewarmness. I pray for you. Your fire will not be replaced. You shall not be like Esau. You will not sell your birthright for a pot of food. You will not sell the ministry of reconciliation for personal personal gains, for lust, for sin, and for whatever. Wherever you, you fell, rise up. Wherever you fell, rise up. The Bible says that let him who has ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. 
I pray for you in the mighty name of Jesus that you will rise up. I know that there is an army in a dry bone. Even if you have become so dry, there's an army in you. You can rise again. Even if you backslided and now you are falling in sin and you think God does not want to see your face. You feel like your anointing is gone. You feel like your fire is gone. You feel like you have been overwhelmed with so much troubles. So you don't want to do this thing again. I pray for you in the mighty name of Jesus Christ that you are coming out so strong. I pray for you in the name of Jesus. You are rising so strong. The fire of the Spirit of God, the prophecies of God, the words of God that have gone ahead of you, they shall not fail. They shall not fail. They shall not fail. I feel like saying what Jesus said. I have prayed for you. I have prayed for you in the name of Jesus Christ. Listen, in that school, at that office, in that family, be a shining and a burning light. Be a shining and a burning light. Be a shining and a burning light. The Bible speaks of John the Baptist. He says he was a shining and a burning light. He was a shining. When you go close to me, when you go close to him, you feel God. When you, when you get close to John the Baptist, you see God. You feel God. There's something unusual about him. I pray for you in the name of Jesus that there will be something unusual about you. At your workplace, people will begin to sense God. One day, I was walking from the house to the church. And whilst I was going, a gentleman stopped me and said, Sir, can I follow you to church? This is like three, four years ago. Can I follow you to church? I said, why? He said, anytime you come to pass, something draws me that I should follow you to church. You know what? I, I took this guy to church, to my father's church. And this guy got born again. He prayed in tongues and his life was changed. Listen, I pray for you in the name of Jesus. That fervency, that fire of God will be felt by nations. Wherever you you are. I feel like there's somebody that is watching me. The hand of God is coming upon you so strong. The hand of God is coming upon you so strong. In the name of Jesus, I can hear the sound of a lady who is crying out for help. Your help has come. Your help has come in the name of Jesus. Your help has come. I hear to tell you there's a mighty prophetess in you. In the name of Jesus Christ and from your mouth, nations will hear God. From your mouth, nations will hear God. To you you whose hands are made to heal the sick in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, that hand will heal. And to the one that is meant to prophesy to the nations, you will. Nothing will stop you. You will. Not even your mistakes, not your flaws, not your sins, not your backslide, not your laziness in the mighty name of Jesus. Because this is a time I'm calling you onto the altar. I'm calling you onto the fire in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. I pray for you. Maybe you're watching me and you don't know Jesus Christ. I want to lead you to the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to pray with you right this moment. Close your eyes. Let me pray with you as we bring this session to a close. Say, dear Lord Jesus, I thank you for dying for me. Thank you for saving me, Lord. I confess with my mouth today that you, you rose from the dead. And I believe with my heart that you are Lord. This day I confess Jesus he is Lord. I confess Jesus. He is Lord. And by his blood, I am washed from my sins. Father, I receive salvation in the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, for making me born again. Thank you, Lord, for making me your child. I declare today I'm part of the family of God. I'm born again. And if you're watching me and you are sick in any part of your body, put your hand wherever you're sick, your eye, your leg, whatever it is, Put your hand there. Let me pray for you. In the name of Jesus, I command that asthma to leave. I command that asthma to leave. I command that asthma to leave in the name of Jesus. That constant headaches that comes at night in the name of Jesus. As you are hearing me, I command you to come out. I command you to come out of your body in the name of Jesus. Let the peace of God remain in your body. Let the power of God remain in your body. And let the fire of God be burning in your heart in the name of Jesus. Thank you for making a time with us. Catch you same time next week in the name of Jesus. Bye.